In the late 1800s, the Museum of Natural History in Clermont-Ferrand, France, obtained a rhinoceros paradoxus femur. What made this find unique was the grooves on its surface. The fossil was discovered in a freshwater limestone, which also contains middle Miocene animal fossils. While some felt that animal teeth had caused the grooves in the bone, Gabriel de Morellet, French prehistorian, disagreed, claiming that the bone had been imprinted by stones moving under geological pressure. However, de Morlay's own description of the marks on the bone cast doubt on this interpretation, as he described them as parallel grooves, somewhat irregular, transverse to the axis of the bone. The cut marks found on the joint surfaces near the femur's end reflect where butchering marks would ordinarily be found, according to Lewis Binford modern expert on chopped bones, whose studies revealed cut marks from stone tools are most commonly made with a sawing motion resulting in short, frequently multiple, but roughly parallel, marks. Two rhinoceros lower jaw parts were discovered in a pit in Billet, France in 1868. There were four deep grooves in one of the shards. According to well-known current authority on cut bones, Marks from stone tools tend to be short, occurring in groups of parallel marks. The marks on the rhino jaw components do match this description. Is it possible that the marks on the bone were made by humans? The jawbone in question was discovered in the Middle Miocene layer, which dates back 15 million years, illustrating just how far away in time it was. According to the researcher, these small grooves running parallel to one another on the lower section of the bone looked, in cross-section, like those made by a hatchet on a piece of hardwood. As a result, it's considered that the marks were made using a portable stone cutting device while the bone was still fresh. This evidence led experts to believe that humans coexisted with the ancient rhino in a geologically remote time. They are simply geological impressions, one debunker remarked after ruling out animal chewing. Although the statement may be correct, it does not provide adequate evidence to support the position. A report, published in the Proceedings of the French Academy of Sciences in April 1868, stated, We now have sufficient evidence to permit us to suppose that the contemporarity of human beings and Miocene mammals is demonstrated. This proof came in the form of a collection of mammalian bones from Sassan, France, that had been purposefully shattered. The fractured bones of the little deer Dicroceras elegans were particularly notable. Sanson's bone beds are classified as Middle Miocene by modern scientists. Consider the catastrophic impact that the presence of humans 15 million years ago would have on the existing evolutionary concepts. Of course, de Morlay, in his usual fashion, insisted some of the sons and bones were fractured by natural processes at the time of fossilization, maybe by desiccation, afterwards by strata movement. Others, such as Garrigo, remained convinced that sons and bones had been fractured by humans in the process of harvesting Maro. Garrigo made his case in 1871 before the International Congress of Prehistoric Anthropology and Archaeology in Bologna, Italy. He initially showed the Congress a collection of recent bones with undeniable butchering and breaking marks. He next displayed bones from a petite deer taken from Sanson as comparison. His bones had the same marks as the modern bones. Guru also revealed that several of the bone fragments had very thin scrape marks, similar to those found in late Pleistocene shattered marrow bones. The first stage in processing marrow bones according to Binford, is to scrape a layer of tissue from the bone surface with a stone tool. Jules de Noray of the French National Museum had visited Saint-Prest in northeastern France a few years earlier to collect fossils. In 1863, he recovered a rhinoceros tibia from the sandy gravels. He spotted a series of thin grooves on the bone, which appeared to have been produced by a sharp knife or blade of flint. After he noticed the little circular marks, which he believed were formed by a pointed tool, he inspected collections of the Saint-Presse fossils at Chartres Museum and the Paris School of Mines, 
and was amazed to find they exhibited the same types of marks. According to modern experts, the scent press site dates from late Pliocene. If Denor's conclusion that the imprints on the mini bones were created by flint instruments is right, it appears that humans were present in France at that period. What's wrong with that, one would wonder. But in terms of our modern understanding of paleoanthropology, quite a bit is wrong. It is thought that modern human species did not exist at the end of the Pliocene, roughly two million years ago. It would seem almost implausible that creatures employing advanced stone tools existed in Europe at the time. Primitive human predecessors were only found in Africa, and they were confined to Australopithecus and Homo habilis, the latter being regarded as the first tool maker. Other scholars have suggested that the Sempressed site is younger than the Pliocene, maybe as young as 1.2 to 1.6 million years old. But even with this modified dating, the incised bones would still be unusual. This discovery of incised bones at Sempressed sparked debate even in the 19th century. Opponents claimed the marks were caused by tools used by the excavators. Denor, on the other hand, demonstrated the cut marks, like the rest of the fossil bone surfaces, were covered with mineral deposits. Sir Charles Lyell, a well-known British geologist, speculated that the traces were formed by rodents' teeth, but Gabriel de Morlay believed the marks could not have been made by animals. Instead, he proposed that they were formed by sharp stones being pushed across the bones by geological pressure. To which Genor countered, many of the incisions had been worn by later rubbing resulting from transport and movement of the bones in the midst of sand and gravels. The resulting markings are of an essentially different character than the original marks and striations. And so, who was correct? Some experts believe the question could be answered if it could be proven that the flint implements made by humans were found in the gravels of Sun Press. The strata at Sun Press were meticulously investigated for such evidence by Louis Bourgeois, a preacher, who also gained a reputation as a skilled paleontologist. Bourgeois eventually discovered a number of flints that he believed were authentic tools, via his patient research, and reported them to the Academy of Sciences in January 1867. The renowned French anthropologist Armand de Quatrefage said the tools, among other things, included scrapers, borers, and lance points. Yet de Morlay was unconvinced, claiming the flints found by Bourgeois at Saint Press had been chipped by geological pressure, his standard go-to answer. In attempting to address one question, the nature of cut traces on bones, we appeared to discover another, how to distinguish human artistry on flints and other stone artifacts. In conjunction with the presence of stone tools at Saint Prince, the famed American paleontologist Harry Fairfield Osborne made the following fascinating statements in 1910. The earliest traces of man in beds of this age were the incised bones discovered by Denor at Saint Prince near Chartres. Doubt as to the artificial character of these incisions has been removed by recent explorations of La Ville Routot, which resulted in the discovery of Eolithic flints fully confirming the discoveries of bourgeois in these deposits in 1867. So in terms of some press findings, it should now be clear that we're dealing with paleontological issues that won't be answered fast or easily. Certainly there isn't enough evidence to rule out these bones as proof of human presence during the Pliocene. This provokes the question of why the some press fossils and others like them are almost never discussed in textbooks on human evolution, with the exception of a few brief, dismissive footnotes. Is it true that the evidence is obviously inadmissible? Or is it possible that the omission or summary rejection is due to the potential late Pliocene antiquity, which contradicts the accepted narrative of human origins? Armand de Quatrefage, professor of the Museum of Natural History in Paris and member of the French Academy of Sciences, agrees in his 1884 book. The objections made to the existence of humans in the Pliocene and Miocene periods seem to habitually be more related to theoretical considerations than to direct observation. Louis Bourgeois created a stir in 1867 when he showed a halotherium bone with signs that appeared to be human incisions to the participants 
the International Congress of Prehistoric Anthropology and Archaeology in Paris. Halotherium is a type of extinct sea cow or manatee that belongs to the Sarinia group of aquatic marine mammals. The Abbe de Lenay discovered the fossilized bones of Halotherium in the shell beds of Berrier near Pouance in northwest France. De Lenay was shocked to see a number of cut marks in a portion of the humerus, a bone from the upper forelimb. The cuts had the same look as the rest of the bone could easily be separated from recent breaks, indicating they were extremely old. The fossilized bone was firmly embedded in an intact layer, indicating that the imprints on the bone were all of the same geological era. The depth the sharpness of the incisions also indicated that they were created before the bone had become petrified. Two different intersecting strokes appeared to have been used to make some of the cuts. They did not appear to be the result of subterranean scraping or compression, even according to De Morlay. But owing to the Miocene age of the stratum in which the bones were discovered, he refused to believe that they were the result of human layer. This is much too old for man, he remarked. Here we have another evident case of theoretical beliefs affecting how a set of facts will be interpreted.